shape of Hemerocallis. I've always been keen on plants since I was a child. I had an allotment with my grandfather and we used to grow vegetables and I used to exhibit at the local flower shows. And just recently we dug out some old pictures from the loft, um, which goes back to those days. In my previous life, I worked for a supermarket. I used to travel the world looking after quality issues on flowers, looking at perhaps roses and carnations in Kenya. I always envied the growers that I used to visit. I thought it was a wonderful way of life, um, having a nursery and attached to where you live, no commute, and I really wanted to do that. This is the lifestyle I used to dream about. My family all involved, works at the bottom of the garden. It's the dream lifestyle. I always liked Hemerocellis. I started out with an orange one, a yellow one, and a red one. Three varieties that I still grow, and they're, they're responsible for me getting hooked. My mission really is to communicate to gardeners what wonderful plants Hemerocellis are. There's a huge range of colors, size of flowers, extended flowering period. The main flowering starts in late June and goes on through July to August. A lot of the new varieties have what they call a rebloom habit, where it will send up another spike um, with further flowers and then possibly a spike beyond that. So potentially they could continue flowering into the frost. The netting is an idea I picked up from growers I visited in Kenya. It just provides a bit of protection from the wind and the sun and keeps the plants that little bit cleaner. Hemerocellis are really difficult to get time just right for the show. It depends a lot on the weather. But as soon as you move them, the flowers are inclined to close and they don't look nearly as good as they are at home. And so it's a matter of growing numbers and being able to select the correct plants on the day. This is a variety I'm hoping to have for Hampton Court. It's called Shadows of the Pyramids. It's a new variety. It's got a washed eye, beautiful colour, beautiful form of flower, which in my opinion is much improved on the old fashioned varieties. Hemerocellis aren't really affected very much by pests and diseases. Whilst they're members of the lily family, they don't get lily beetle. One of the problems that they do get um, is a recent pest that arrived in this country, is gall midge. And if you see buds that are swollen, the thing to do is to snap them off, put them in a poly bag, um, put it in the rubbish. Don't put them on the compost heap because the bugs in this thing will hatch out and reinfect for next year. Last year I displayed Hemerocellis for the first time at Hampton Court and I got a silver gilt. The challenge this year is to go better. I've got a bigger site, I've got more plants, um, I'll be trying that bit harder. Hi Paul, plenty of blues, plenty of good colour, but Hemerocal is such a tricky plant to show, isn't it? They're great garden plants, lovely at home, but you start moving them to a show, they're really difficult. Um, you put them in a van and move them, they're inclined to sulk. <laughs> but it's a matter of growing enough plants to be able to select from. Now, some people see them as a very traditional plant and don't quite know how to, you know, maybe use them in a more contemporary setting or, or, or update them in a way. What would you say to that? Um, a lot of people know the old-fashioned orange and yellow varieties, um, but there's a lot of improvements that become available in recent years. Um, a lot of the new varieties, um, such as All-American Chief or Sabine Burr, um, have a tremendous range of colours. Um, beautiful eyes and edges and a lovely flower form and really my mission is to get the gardeners to understand the modern varieties that are available now. There are some beauty, all American chief, I like that. So it's not so much about the medal, it's more about just showing people your passion for Henry Callis and trying to get them involved. It is, um, to bring to gardeners attention the, the wonders that are available in Henry Callis these days. Well good luck with them and thanks for bringing them. Thanks, thanks. Joe. But of course, these wonderful hemerocallis are not the only midsummer blooms that flower at this time of year. As you walk in the marquee, you're bowled over by flowers that peak right now. And before the show opened, Rachel had a good look around. Some of the displays in here are impossible to miss. Just look at these dahlias. Such a variety of shape and of course, color. And I think they must be one of the star performers in the mid and late season garden. 
I grow them in a mixed border, but I also have a small bed that's packed with them in my kitchen garden, so I've got plenty to cut for the house. And I found something just a little bit different here on the Lockyer stand, and they're showing here at Hampton Court for the first time this year. These are all spiky members of the Solanum family. And you can see that these sharp spines go all the way up and down the stems and across the leaf surface. Now this one, which comes from South America, is Purpureum, but its common name is Purple Devil, which I think speaks volumes. This is one from Africa, and it's Snake Apple. So I think it does tell you that although they're from the same family as potatoes and tomatoes, you can see that from the flower, I wouldn't recommend eating these fruits because they're toxic. If you do fancy having a go at these, well, they grow well from seed. Put them in a pot and keep them on the patio so that then they can be moved over winter because they need protection. They're not hardy. But when you do move them, watch out for those spikes. Poplars have a wonderful display of mid and late season flowers like this salvia and the sanguisorba, the flattened heads of the achillea. But my eye has been caught by this Spiralsia incarna. And it's that combination of apricot flowers and grey green foliage that I think is really quite unusual. It'll do best in a nice warm shelter position and it likes a nice open gritty soil. Harvey's garden plants are showing this stunning double echinacea. It's called hot papaya, very aptly named, I think. And within its lineage are these two species echinaceas. We've got Paradoxa, which comes from the central southern states of America, places like Texas. Very warm, so it sends down a long taproot to search out moisture. And then this one is Purpurea, which comes from further north and towards the east. It's much more temperate climate, so the root system there is more fibrous. And that's what this one has inherited, so it's much better suited to growing in our climate. And in fact, it's the first with this sort of orange colouring to have that characteristic. And it looks beautiful here against the backdrop of that dark dahlia foliage. So there we are, a perfect planting combination to try at home. Hampton has become known for its conceptual gardens. Now these are the provocative designs that challenge our traditional notion of a garden. There are nine this year, the most ever shown at Hampton, and for one of its new designers, it has not been without its challenges. Anushka Filer found out literally days after the RHS had accepted her design that she was expecting twins. Now, when it comes to help, they say mum's the word, but in Anushka's case, it was her dear old dad that was the first port of call. I chose to do the concept garden category because I think it's uh, a very exciting area of garden design. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. Excuse me while I kiss the sky is a fantastic quote from Jimi Hendrix that really encapsulates what I want uh, the garden to feel like. But I wanted to create a space that people come into that allows a sense of being able to see things from a different perspective. Concept design really allows you to make a statement uh, beyond the norm. You can just go as bonkers as you like and I think that's really uh, a freeing principle. The concept behind the boundary is to have a mirror at 45 degrees in a circle around the garden. The effect, hopefully, that will be created is that of a sky um, reflecting all the way around the boundary. I went to a set designer and they came back with a fantastic quote of £25,000, at which point I thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I thought, I'll give my old dad a call and see what he thinks about this problem. Anushka phoned me one Sunday morning and um, I, I knew straight away what she was after, but I had to play hard to get. He's wonderfully talented with his hands. Uh, he loves working with wood and loves unique projects. So I was hoping that I might uh, persuade him. She seemed to think that I wouldn't be, really want to be involved in it, but deep down I, I would have been desperately cross if I wasn't. It was really about trying to, trying to work out what she wanted 
and try and work out the best way I could do it. I have two different areas for planting. Um, the first area is the ground level planting, which is a sea of agapanthus, which are lovely, have lovely blue heads. The other plants that I'm using are the plants for the upside down garden. The upside down planting did provide a bit of a challenge in that obviously as soon as you turn the plants upside down they're going to be in shady conditions. So I've chosen plants that are particularly tolerant of part shade. I went for hostas and ferns. I love the way that hostas and ferns have fantastic colour variations in green from blue to more yellowy greens and I wanted to create a very large textural ceiling which have hints of blue so I've then picked on a few different varieties such as a Campanula and a Tradescantia to bring out some blue and tie it all into the rest of the garden. I uh, found out the same week um, that I was doing Hampton Court uh, that uh, I was also pregnant with twins <laughs> so I will be about four weeks off um, full term with the twins um, when the show is on and hopefully if even if I hang myself upside down I, <laughs> I will still be there. Well, you are here, all yes. three of you, at the show. But of course, you must have had a lot of help with the build. My friends and family, they've all been hands on deck for the last two weeks. I couldn't have done it without them. What about the title of the garden? Yes, Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky is a Jimi Hendrix quote. And I got it because I used the metaphor, the sky's the limit, as a inspiration for the garden and every element is about seeing the sky and if you want to have a big idea you've really got to reach for the sky and, and go for it. The idea of having plants hanging down, where did that come from? Well, I was on a trip to Venice and um, I went into a room and I was handed a mirror and when I looked in the mirror I could see this wonderful ceiling of Renaissance paintings and it was just such a memorable experience that I thought it would be quite lovely to create the same effect, well, in a much smaller way in um, my garden. I love the mirror around here which at the moment is just reflecting the soft cloud cover, mm. it's really beautiful. When it's sunshine and cloud, you get to see a sort of movement right the way through the garden as you walk around it. And that gives you a lovely kind of um, dynamism to the garden, so no view is ever the same. Well, sky's the limit idea and a beautiful garden. Many congratulations. I hope tonight's preview has whetted your appetite to come down here and visit the show for yourself. We shall be here on Thursday and Friday, and we'll be joined on both days by Alice Fowler, who will be hunting out plant stories and also talking to obsessive plant collectors. We've got an interview with Chris Beardshaw about how he's trained three young landscapers to realize his design for his show garden. So if you can't get here, join us at eight o'clock on Thursday night on BBC Two. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Jeremy Paxman back with a new series of University Challenge here on BBC Two Next.